welcome to this first joint event of the Manchester Classical Association and the Glossop Community Bookshop in Glossop, the George Street Community Bookshop. Um, and we have uh, Jonathan Atkinson from that bookshop, who's going to just tell us a little bit about the work they do in the local community uh, before handing back to me to introduce this evening's paper. Yeah, uh, fantastic. Yeah, thank you, April. Um, yeah, this is our first kind of um, ideas, lecture, seminar uh, for the George Street Community Bookshop. And um, we're hoping to do a lot more um, over the next few months, maybe one day in person, we'll see. Um, for those of you, and I know people have come from all over the country, maybe all over the world, I don't know. But um, we're based in Glossop, which is a small town between Manchester and Sheffield in the north of uh, the UK. Uh, we're a community bookshop, which means we're owned by the local local community here. Um, we exist to operate in their benefit. Um, we are shut at the moment, very sadly, um, like all uh, non-essential shops. Um, but we have our website, which you can see here. And if you go onto books, you can see we have a number of books, about 5,000. Uh, yeah, nearly 5,000 available online. So um, we've got, I think, around 25,000. So in time, there'll be more and more. So I'll hand back to April. But yeah, just to say thanks to everyone for coming. And I really look forward to Peter's talk. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so we welcome uh, a non-classicist uh, into our clutches uh, this evening. So it's a great honour to welcome Dr. Peter Linfield, who is an art historian uh, and is a research associate and recently a Leverhulme Early Career Research Fellow at Manchester Metropolitan University. And he works on forgeries. He's not a forger, he works on uh, forgeries in the uh, late Georgian early Victorian period and their manifestations and debates around authenticity and antiquarian material culture, particularly around early Victorian Britain and involving uh, the ancient world as well. Um, he's been closely uh, involved in heritage in the region around Manchester, most notably uh, around the Victorian forger George Shaw, who um, around Upper Mill in Oldham uh, was involved in the forgeries or maybe not around issues to do with what Peter has told us is in fact, Henry VII's marital bed. Uh, and he maybe will mention that later on. Uh, he did his PhD in 2012 at St Andrews uh, on furnishing Britain Gothic as a national aesthetic, 1740 to 1840. And he's been involved in numerous, too numerous to mention here, collaborations and explore, uh, publications exploring the ruins of 18th century Britain and Gothic revival uh, architecture. He's got various uh, publications you can check on his website. And he's also been involved with Visit Manchester in uh, the Haunt Manchester uh, tourism uh, of, of the heritage of the region. So I'm going to hand over to Peter uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about all of this work. Great, thank you very much, April. And um, hello to everyone, uh, wherever uh, you are. I'm hopefully, yes, hopefully you can all see my PowerPoint. Yep, perfect. Um, so I've, uh, this is very much a work in progress. It's part of uh, what April mentioned um, as uh, one of the monographs to arise from my Leverhulme Early Career Research Fellowship, um, which is looking at forgery across the Georgian and early Victorian periods. And uh, I've luckily been in Italy um, quite a lot um, and absorbed a fair amount of material which the grand tourists would have done. And I'm particularly interested in how um, the appetite for classical antiquity was filled uh, by restorers um, and particularly restorers who tended to be uh, rather imaginative and naughty, uh, bending the truth rather. Um, so what I'm going to give you is an excerpt of my uh, current chapter that I'm working on in, in the book on antiquarian forgery, uh, looking specifically at classical sculpture. So, ancient sculpture was integral to the widespread interest in classical antiquity in 18th century Britain. 
there was a ready supply of well-heeled British aristocrats, the newly moneyed, and architects going to the continent on what has been termed the Grand Tour to experience and absorb history. Tourists were willing and often compelled to acquire objects to record their time in Italy, and such relics were intended for display amongst Britain's art collections back at home and in country seats and townhouses, as you can see here uh, in this fantastic hall at Kedleston in Derbyshire. These acquisitions were endowed with importance and they afforded their owners prestige. And the value of such relics can be seen um, earlier in the 17th century, for example, in this portrait um, by Daniel Mitens, Thomas Howard, 14th Earl of Arundel, in which the prolific art collector can be seen pointing to his collection of sculpture in his palatial home, Arundel House in London, on the Strand, uh, with a baton. Such collections, albeit of varying scales and quality, was central also to the Georgian aesthetic and intellectual climate. British tourists did not simply want to collect sculptural relics whilst on the tour, but they also commissioned, for example, portrait paintings um, memorializing their time there. These portraits could be strewn with great architectural monuments from the classical period, such as the Colosseum, or more recent, though no less important examples, such as St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, together with known sculptures, and perhaps also, as you can see on the screen here, architectural fragments. And painters did particularly well out of this demand. Pompeo Batone became the leading portrait painter in mid 18th century Rome with tourists, guides, as well as visitors, friends, relatives, and spouses recommending Batone as the painter to visit for one's portrait. Of Batone's numerous portraits, a notable example is Francis Bassett, which we can see here on the left, first Baron de Dunstanville and Bassett from 1778. He nonchalantly rests on the classical pedestal. And this, these two paintings here, represent a new type of portraiture popularized by Batoni from the 1750s, where these classical remains are instrumental to placing the aristocrats within Italy and also the classical framework. Um, sorry, give me a second. Yes, on the image on the right, um, we can see um, the Medici vase and Ludovic Va sorry the Medici vase and Ludovici Mars, uh, which are, cl are clear and important elements within this portrait. They celebrate Talbot's time in Rome, and ultimately serve as marks of his taste and erudition. It is certainly no accident that these and other similar pieces of sculpture were incorporated into Bertone's Grand Tour portraiture because they reflect the most important examples picked out for visitors to view whilst they were in Italy. For example, uh, one of the guidebooks is an account of some of the statues, bas reliefs, drawings and pictures in Italy from 1722 by Jonathan Richardson Sr. and Jr. Batoni is therefore appealing to and celebrating the canon of popular classical remains valued by British tourists in the city. The profound influence that classical remains had upon 18th century British visitors to Rome can be gauged by a passage written by Edward Southwell Jr., a Whig politician, during his time in Rome in 1726. He writes, I have spent three months with great pleasure and some profit among the ancient and modern curiosities of this famous city, which have cost me daily reading and application and filled 140 pages in my journal. And I must own these heaps of magnificent ruins and the view of so many places, not only renowned for the actions and fate of so many heroes, but by the pens of so famous writers do fill the mind with great ideas of Roman grandeur, as well as with various reflections upon the vicissitudes of all human things. Rome's seemingly endless wealth of historic artefacts that occupied the attention of visitors like Southwell 
is ably captured in a number of paintings by Giovanni Paolo Panini um, entitled Roma Antica, Ancient Rome from around 1755. And this one is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. These imaginary academic capriccios bring together the most famous pieces of classical sculpture, such as um, on the bottom right of the Laocoon and in the middle um, distance in the center of the painting, the Apollo Belvedere, as well as paintings of famous architecture, including the Colosseum, the Pantheon, Trajan's Column, and so on. Such pieces of antiquity, when viewed in the flesh, were highly emotive to the British visitor, as John Northall, an army officer and travel writer, recorded. Of all the entertainments in Italy, there is nothing more agreeable than that which arises from the observation of antique statues. To see the emperors, consuls, generals, orators, philosophers, poets, and other great men whose fame in history engaged our earliest notice standing as it were in their own persons before us, gives a man a gaze of almost 200 years backwards and mixes the past ages with the present. Northall also noted how sculpture preserved the beauties too of those earlier times, to say nothing of the ideal ones, the nymphs and the goddesses. 18th century visitors did not only want to view Rome's classical remains and record their time in the city by commissioning commemorative portraits by, for example, Bettone, um, but also, like the 14th Earl of Arundel in the 17th century, acquire antiquities for their personal collections. An industry developed to supply this demand, and Thomas Jenkins, Gavin Hamilton, Robert Fagan, and James Byers set themselves up as dealers in Italy. And with a view to supplying such dealers and also collectors, restorers like Bartolomeo Cavaceppi and Giovanni Battista Piranese helped fulfill tourists' demand for ancient sculpture. Excavation sites proliferated with the hope of unearthing valuable marketable remains, perhaps even exceptional pieces like those uncovered in the 16th century, such as the Laocoon um, in 1506. Though it is worth mentioning that high quality um, discoveries, um, such as the Laocoon um, or, or pieces discovered in the 18th century, um, would not actually be allowed out of Italy and more than likely would be um, acquired um, by the um, church um, for its own collection, uh, like the Laocoon. Um, the result of this appetite is well explained in Zoffany's Charles Townley in his gallery um, in London, uh, which is representative of the material that collectors amassed um, from Rome. And this is the crux of it really. Not all the relics sold to Rome's visitors were genuinely historic, either as they appeared or were claimed to be by dealers or restorers. And this is interesting in the way that this idea of restoration um, enters a rather murky ground where not everything is as it seems, which I, I will um, explore now. Some sculptures have been restored heavily, whilst others were almost entirely modern fabrications al antica. Al antica refers to a style of imitating ancient art, and Al Antica sculpture was consequently designed to appear far older than its true age. Indeed, the demand to own collectible relics and the widespread interventions undertaken to prepare such pieces for sale created a space in the market that enterprising restorers could harness to generate new pieces of sculpture that appeared to be and that they claimed to be ancient. Such fakes mirrored the much more well-known industry producing fake coins and medals. For example, when the antiquary and collector Ralph Thoresby visited Thomas Herbert, 8th Earl of Pembroke at Wilton House in Wiltshire in 1701, he recorded being shown a strange variety of counterfeits. In some, the metal was genuine, but inscriptions false. In others, one side of the metal genuine, the other counterfeit. In others, one part of the metal right and the other soldered to it wrong, 
with a medal of the two famous Padrian brothers, whose counterfeits are not only hard to be distinguished from the originals, but, and this is really quite interesting, to be preferred to bad ones, though genuine. This is, that's, that's quite interesting. Faked up antique sculpture appears to have been less concerning to collectors of some sorts. Um, unlike the spurious new old coins that I've just mentioned that were in circulation. The boundary between genuinely ancient and Al Antica sculpture was blurred. In the 17th century, the 14th Earl of Arundel, for example, mixed genuine historic sculpture that he collected from Rome and brought back to England with more modern examples manufactured in the Al Antica style. But rather than being hoodwinked, by enterprising fabricators selling their products as genuine historic pieces, Arundel knowingly acquired fabrications to bolster his collection of ancient sculpture. He resorted to such actions because, as I've already mentioned, as a foreigner in Italy, he was limited as to what pieces of art he could acquire and export. Namely, they frankly had to be not particularly first rate. I don't want to say bad, but they were not well, not um, good pieces were kept in Italy. Um, he was also likewise constrained as to which artist he could employ to produce these fabrications. He used uh, a particularly not first rate artist either to produce them. So important discoveries were made in Italy, particularly to the south of Rome with the uncovering of Pompeii and Herculaneum in the early 18th century. Johann Joachim Winkelmann, which we can see here, a German historian and archaeologist, and also the papal antiquary. So Winkelmann was one of the people at one point during the 18th century who had the power to say, yes, you can have that for X amount, or no, the church is getting that. So he was really quite an important person. Um, he's, he recorded the discoveries made in Herculaneum and Pompeii in some detail. Um, so despite tapping into a rich vein of antiquities, many reclaimed pieces in Italy uh, from the 18th century were damaged significantly. For example, statues of three female figures that Winkelmann identified as Vestals were unearthed and sent to Rome for repair. Two of the statues were complete, but the third was missing a head. What did they do? they replaced it with a completely unrelated ancient example. Similar repairs, replacing missing parts such as heads, hands, whole limbs or fingers, noses, parts of faces, so on and so forth, um, was ubiquitous. But unlike these vestals, not all the material was ancient. Um, for example, uh, a male figure uh, from the Villa dei uh, Papiri was completed by the addition of Sophocles' head from the Farnese collection. This head and the body had nothing to do with one another, which complicated it significantly. So the 18th century interventions necessary to make these classical remains complete and saleable had a significant impact upon um, the remains. They were no longer as they were intended to be. Um, and that compromises, at least to our modern perspective, their historical um, authority. Other examples of highly innovative conservation, and I use conservation in inverted commas because this is absolutely not um, uh, uh, conservation as we would know it today, um, can be seen in regard to a number of bronze horses. And when I read this, it's actually really quite hilarious. Um, Winkelmann records that the remaining pieces of the chariot, horses and figures were finally taken back to Potici and stored in the vaults under the royal palace, entirely out of public view, as one does. It's not good to have bits and pieces lying around on public view. Um, a long time later, the curator of the museum proposed putting together at least one horse from the remaining pieces of horses, and the idea was approved. So the bronze workers from Rome who were assigned to work on other discoveries turned their hand to this work. The requisite pieces for the whole horse could no longer be found, and they had to cast a few new pieces, eventually putting together a singular horse, a handsome one. How interesting. 
But clearly, this reassembled horse, which you can see on the left-hand side here, was a composite, not only of different pieces of bronze, which had been discovered and reunited from different horses, but also modern um, pieces filling in those bits that were missing. So this is like any other uh, restoration going on in 18th century Italy. Um, new material was added to the old fragments to create one complete work, which in theory was ancient, but in reality, it's, it's compromised. Indeed, Winkelmann comments directly upon the appearance of this restored antique, in quotation marks, horse, noting its deceptive presentation as an entire intact historical artifact. But this, this illusion did not last long. He records, whether well or badly put together, the horse looked as if it had been made in one piece until by and by, the badly joined and smeared over seams separated from the heat, for it is difficult to join a new casting to a break in ancient bronze. And so in March 1759, while I was there, a heavy rain fell, water ran into the joins, and the horse got dropsy. They tried to conceal this disgrace of restoration with the utmost care. The courtyard of the museum was kept closed for three days until the water had been drained from the horse's belly. This was clearly a poor fix, and it demonstrates how otherwise hidden restorations could be revealed in dramatic terms. So such interventions uh, were also made, as I said, to marble sculptures, but without the chance of getting dropsy. Um, these restorative programs were highly involved undertakings, the scale of the operation, a need for materials to repair and complete ancient fragments can be seen in a letter written by the Scottish artist and antiques dealer Gavin Hamilton to Charles Townley, the English aristocrat and notable collector, which I showed you his collection in London a short while ago. Um, and this letter records events from 1769. It begins by stating that I employed my sculptor to go with another man to the villa Adriana in search of marble to restore statues. This expedition actually unearthed a range of materials that proved essential to, as it turns out, out and out forgeries. Hamilton explored this site, particularly searching for additional artifacts that he recorded, and he recorded that, after some weeks work underground by lamplight and up to the knees in muddy water, we found an exit to the water of Pantanello, which though it was a great measure drained, still my men were obliged to work past the knees in stinking mud, full of toads and serpents and all kinds of vermin. A beginning of the carver was made at the mouth of the drain, where formerly Lolly had planted his pump, which he found choked up with trunks of trees and marble of all sorts amongst which was discovered a head now in, museum, now, now in the possession of Mr. Greville. This was followed by the vase of peacocks and fish now in the Museo Clementino. A fine greyhound, a ram's head, and several fragments were afterwards discovered. Uh, Lolly was uh, someone, uh, he, he basically um, did a, worked on, worked on the site um, um, earlier and abandoned it due to um, the difficulties and expense of actually um, extracting um, pieces uh, from, from, from the site. Um, further discernment surrounding the restoration of fragmentary discoveries like that already um, or just mentioned in this letter can be found in the correspondence and artifacts connected with this man, Sir William Hamilton, collector, dealer and British ambassador to the court of Naples. He's best known for amassing vases. And if you can see on his uh, plume, uh, behind his plumed hat in the cabinet, um, there is, there is a, um, a vase um, here representative of his collection. Um, he, he faced competition um, collecting such pieces as he recorded in the letter to Charles Grenville from the 6th of June, 1790. I'm sure that the mine of these va uh, vases lately discovered must fail soon, and I therefore have not let one essential vase escape me. 
though the price is much higher than it was formerly. So there's this idea of competition to discover what was available. Um, it, it was really quite an exciting time. The two most famous items that he sent back to Britain um, are the Warwick vase, which I'm showing you here on screen now, and the Portland vase. Hamilton purchased the Warwick vase from Gavin Hamilton, who discovered, in, discovered it in Hadrian's villa in 1771. And it was described by Piranesi as demonstrating the perfection of art from Hadrian's time. Perfezione della arte del secolo di Adriano. Hamilton bought it from the Scottish dealer in pieces, and he set about reconstructing it, including undertaking significant repairs. Indeed, he was obliged to cut a block of marble at Carrara to repair it, which has been hollowed out and the fragments fixed on it, which means the vase is as firm and entire as the day it was made. So you can see here that the fragments of this vase are being reconstituted along with the pieces uh, missing, being filled in by this newly hewn piece of marble. This reconstruction was a laborious process. And as a letter from James Byers, Scottish architect and antiquary, and to Sir William from the 26th of February, 1772 records, the model of your great vase is at last finished in stucco and the ancient pieces inserted. I have the honor of sending you three drawings of it. Although I suppose you will not think of having it executed in marble until you see it yourself. I thought it best to send you these drawings. After measuring it with exactness, calculating the quantity of marble necessary and the expense of working and other changes, found that it might be done for 800 crowns. You know that it is a noble style of sculpture and the most noble thing of that kind I ever saw. I would be a thousand pity, it would be a thousand pities if it were not restored. So here there's a clear distinction between the new uh, marble and the genuine ancient works and also it, its quality is really recognized um, at this time. This was no minor undertaking and the restoration or more, more properly reconstruction was undertaken. A drawing which you can see here on screen together with measurements um, showing progress made on the artifact is included as the header to a letter from Piranese uh, to Charles Townley of the 3rd of August, 1772. Replying on the 14th of August to the letter, Townley emphasised the pleasure this drawing gave him and how it appeared to be the most beautiful monument to antiquity. Of course, it was absolutely no longer an authentic historical remnant due to the interventions undertaken. So William Hamilton unsuccessfully offered it for sale for £500. So there's clearly a market here in these antiquities. This would have covered his costs associated with purchasing the remnants from Gavin Hamilton and restoring it. For in 1774, he recorded that it is now, it is only now upon the point of being finished and is far beyond any monument of the kind at Rome. It has cost me nearly £300. So this vase represented, in theory, a 200 pound profit. Not bad. It was also, this profit was clearly important and also a character of the restoration scheme. But, and I think this is really interesting, a debate over the appearance of the finished vase and the interventions taken to complete it or refurbish it um, emerged. In particular, there was um, a desire to preserve some semblance of historical credibility and in um, uh, inverted commas again, authenticity. And this is captured in a letter dated Rome, 9th of August, 1774 by Byers to Sir William Hamilton, where he writes, the great vase is nearly finished. And I think it comes well. I begged of Mr. Gavin Hamilton, to go with me the other day to give his opinion. And Hamilton is very familiar with um, classical remains. Hamilton approved much of the restoration, but thought the female mask copied from that in Pyrenees' Candelabro ought to be a little retouched to give more squareness and character. He's of the opinion that the foot ought neither to be fluted nor ornamented, but left as it is, being antique, 
which is, I think, quite curious, and that no ornament ought to be introduced on the body of the vase behind the handles, saying that it would take away from the effect and grouping of the masks. Piranesi of this is of the same opinion relative to the foot, but he thinks there is, a, there is too great an emptiness behind the handles, and proposed putting the quattrole and zampone. It is difficult to say which of these opinions ought to be followed, but I rather lean to Mr. Hamilton's being persuaded that, was, that there was originally no ornament on that place, as there certainly arose what the Italians call a puntello, a, a support, uh, to strengthen and support the handles of which there is a vestige attached to one of the ancient pieces. This difference of opinion seems marginal, but there's really quite an important separation of the views and the nature of the interventions uh, that should be applied to the vase, um, given that it is effectively a speculative uh, restoration uh, attempting to replace those bits, those undocumented bits, which have been lost. The question is what to replace them with. Clearly, Piranesi wanted decoration, um, Gavin Hamilton not. So, these are moderate things. Now to move on to something which is really quite exceptional. Um, the interventions explored already, of course, as I've said, uh, mildly deceptive, uh, but they were more imaginative, uh, to use um, the, the inverted commas once again, restorations proposed by Piranesi uh, along the lines of the Warwick Vars, but on a much grander scale, which suggests a cavalier relationship with truth and history. More profound fakery took place uh, with the fabrication of a pair of tall shares purchased by Sir, Richard, uh, Sir Roger Newdigate from Piranesi in Rome in May 1775. And these are wholesale, absolutely 75% uh, are modern uh, forgeries. Upon arriving in England, um, the candle stands, which we can see on the right-hand side of this screen, um, and I've um, exploded them up onto the left, um, were sent to the University of Oxford, an institution that Sir Roger Newdigate served as MP, and they were placed in the Radcliffe camera, seen in this 17, uh, 1818 engraving um, of the library from the Oxford Almanac. A record of the Newdigate Piranesi transaction for the Torchers survives incredibly in the Warwickshire County Record Office, um, describing them and their purported discovery. Um, I, the undersigned, undertake to pay the sum of 1,000 Roman scudi to Giovanni Battista Piranese for payment of two large candelabra I compared and now existing in one of the rooms in, of his museum. These candelabra were found uh, in the site called Pantanello in Hadrian's Villa, as he says in his prints published amongst the collection of vases and candelabra. The crucial evidence here is the claim that they had been found on the site of Hadrian's Villa. Uh, in the translation, uh, Piranesi claims uh, this exactly. Indeed, um, in his important 1778 publication, Basi Candelibri, Chippy, um, he included uh, two plates um, displaying uh, various views of uh, one of the two Nudicate candelabra as on the left, plate 25, and the right, plate 26. Um, and as you can see on the screen, they're annotated. On the left, we can read ancient marble candelabra in a great bulk found in the 1769 excavations of Hadrian's Villa. It is shown in perspective on the following plate, uh, another advantageous view. Yes, this candelabra, uh, which the other triangular sides demonstrates in two plates in different aspects, has its division amongst other precious ornaments that compose it, uh, the heads of the elephants located in that place uh, with great industry. Um, these two singular pieces of antiquity, one owned by Piranese and restored by him under his direction, were bought here in Rome. The second plate on the right, um, depicting two sides of the Torcher uh, in perspective, includes a caption that continues to underline not only the importance of these Torchers, but also um, their antiquity and historical value. Um, it is notable for its elegant truthfulness, 
ha ha. And the, uh, the idea of carvings with finely sculpted taste on the sculptures with graceful dis distribution of grotesques. Um, amongst other antiquities, it was found in the excavation made in 1769 in the site called Pantanello, two miles away from Tivoli, uh, owned by the Lolly family. And in ancient times, a lake belonging to the delights of Hadrian's villa. Their value, and we can see them here today um, in the uh, Arundel Sculpture Gallery in the Ashmolean Museum um, in Oxford. So go in, uh, turn left, um, and they are uh, at the end of the gallery. Um, so they're, they're uh, wonderfully lit up, although um, the, the photographs are a bit overexposed. Um, so the value of these two um, tour shares as ancient remains discovered in 1769 is left beyond doubt by the captions, uh, including Piranesi's um, 1778 publication. And this opinion is reiterated upon the tour shares arrival in Oxford. A letter to Sir Roger from the university's vice chancellor, George Horne, dated 26th of February 1777, and you could say, given that Sir Roger was the MP and uh, Horne was the um, vice chancellor of the university, he wasn't exactly the most um, uh, objective, uh, impartial, impartial rather, a person to be um, commenting on them. Uh, he writes that the candelabra are put up with great judgment and excite the admiration of all who see them, being indeed a perfect school in themselves of sculpture and architecture. Horne clearly valued them. Um, as uh, celebrated antique survivals deposited within the university to enhance its collection of applied arts, including, for example, um, the Arundel marbles and Pomfret marbles, which now are associated with them, and which Sir Roger was instrumental in um, arranging the bequest. The true nature of these torches, however, is far less honourable. Uh, whilst they can make some claim to antiquity, they were certainly not discovered whole in the shadow of Hadrian's villa, or to use Horn's phrase, represent a perfect school in themselves of sculpture, unless that school is based upon uh, modern 18th century deceit. Whilst the new de Gator shares are made from pieces, uh, from par partly from pieces of antique marble, um, it's only 15% of the whole structure. Um, this percentage was um, arrived at uh, when the tour shares were um, uh, restored recently by Oxford. Um, this is hardly filling in the gaps like the Warwick Vars. Um, this is rather making something and adding little bits and pieces on, uh, which those little bits and pieces are the genuine antiquities, uh, which of course have necessarily nothing to do with tour shares. Um, Crucial to carry, carry out this deception. Um, and you can see the various uh, details um, of the tour shares on screen, or hopefully you can see them, um, are these fine cracks. Um, these are uh, largely modern uh, pieces, well, when I say modern, um, 18th century pieces of the marble um, by Piranese, uh, which have been intentionally broken and re-glued together in the 18th century to give the impression that they are actually restored pieces of genuine um, uh, classical sculpture, but in fact, they're, they're modern fabrications. Um, doubt over the actual credentials um, naturally arose, um, and also um, suggesting Horn's uh, far too optimistic view of them uh, was well, indeed unfounded. Um, the posthumous publication Works by James Barry uh, contains the following uh, co contains the following assessment. It was about this time that a considerable number of works were erected in which the capitals and other ornamental pieces of architecture were in so fantastic a manner, with so little of the true forms remaining uh, that they serve indifferently for all kinds of things and are with ease converted into candelabras, chimney pieces, and whatnot. Examples of this kind of trash may be seen in abundance in the collection of Piranesi, who is well known in the world as an ingenious engraver of ruins and ornaments. And as we can see here, um, uh, one would hate to call these uh, august pieces of sculpture in the Ashmolean trash. Uh, they certainly were uh, considered to be trash at the time, given how they are not what they are claimed to be. Um, 
And indeed, um, if we compare here, uh, one of the uh, new Egypt tour shares on the left with an example um, I uh, saw in the Vatican Museum, um, you can really get a, a, a handle on the relationship. Um, Pyrenees's candelabra are compared when they're compared with um, surviving examples from antiquity. Um, the differences are, I think, patently obvious. Um, there are clear similarities, of course, the tripod base, uh, the upper disc from which uh, light or incense would be emitted, uh, and also the use of the canthus ornament. But Piranesi has imbued his creations with uh, layer upon layer upon layer of highly decorative ornament derived uh, from various other sources, uh, such as altars, sarcophagi, and furniture to create really a riot of imaginative decoration that is related to classical antiquity, but in certainly in no way is it um, equivalent to, um, to ancient pieces. Um, so I think the highly ornate nature of the new de Goethe tour shares resonates with Piranesi's proposal, the unreal unrealized proposal for the work bars, which I've mentioned. Uh, in short, whilst he claimed these um, pieces to be ancient and restored, the tour shares are in fact almost entirely modern fabrications uh, marketed to collectors like Newdigert with spurious claims of antiquity. It's with little regard to strict historical accuracy um, that these um, tour shares, uh, despite Pyrenees' claims, are clear modern fakes. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.